young children. You most likely have had a toy like this before. Hey, Silas, will you bring me that toy? All right. That's a sharp looking polo you got on there, buddy. Love you. Love you, Silas. He's like, Dad, stop. Stop, Dad. So you see one of these toys. Oh, oh, I didn't mean to make you mad, Si. Come back, buddy. Um, you see one of these toys now, and usually when you see one of these toys, there's usually like a whole box of it. I don't know, maybe the kids' ministry budget was running low. But anyway, it's just that you just get the top of this one. Um, so this is one of those toys that inside of it you have all these different shapes. You got a square and circle and triangles, and you got like a star. And then, oh, there's a cross. We're teaching them young, you know? I'm just kidding. That's a plus sign. So you get the point. Obviously, you, you get this toy, and, and this triangle for young children is supposed to go in triangle spot. And likewise, the circle will not fit in the square or any of the other shapes, but it must go in that one. And likewise, all the way through, it won't go in the other spots unless it fits the shape because it's incompatible with... The other space is only compatible with that right there, with the right spot. Now, I'm sharing this today because what Paul is going to talk to us about is incompatibility. That it is incompatible for those of us who are in Christ to worship anything else that is not Christ. He's been on this, on this trail since the beginning of chapter 8, dealing with the issue of food sacrificed to idols. And he's going to lay the hammer down today with his major imperative that he's been building towards to verse 14, which says, therefore, my beloved, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. He's going to finally like swing the bat. And here's his overall point since chapter eight, the challenge to flee from idolatry. We think about idolatry and we ask, what exactly is idolatry? idolatry. We don't really have, you know, you know, these wooden sculptures or golden calves or that thing that Indiana Jones had in his movie. You know, we don't have those things here per se. So what is modern day idolatry? Idolatry can simply be described as anything that directs our worship away from God. Anything that sort of steals away God's rightful place in our life, anything that we begin to worship over and above our creator. When we begin to put our, or, or to maybe seek peace or security in things that are apart from God, that becomes an idol. When we begin to rest in earthly things, we make an idol of them. When we pursue pleasure in something contrary to, to the Christian life, we are showing our hearts are running away from God's word and towards evil, not what is good and holy. When we elevate or glorify really anything other than God, we make an idol of it. So Paul has been talking to the Corinthian Christians who have been making a case that, you know, eating food in the temple of an idol doesn't affect them. It's just food. It's just a building. We're just making friends. You know, we're, it's all for Jesus. And they're making all these excuses because they're so wise. Paul comes along and says, no, 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 you are misguided. That is not the case. And he swats in the most straightforward kind of way. And so we need to be the kind of people who hear it today and heed it today. We need to be the kind of people who listen in and receive God's word for us. Let me give you the main idea. Here it is. Christians are called to be a holy people, wholly devoted to our holy God. Christians are called to be holy, H-O-L-Y, people, wholly devoted, H-W-H-O-L-L-Y, wholly devoted to a holy God. Three things he's going to tell us. We should consider our life, consider our fellowship with Christ, and third, consider our participation with demons. You're like, what? All right, let's read together, see what he says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 14. Therefore, my beloved, my dear friends, your text may say, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. I speak as to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? 
the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body. For we all partake of the, of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participates, participants in the altar? What do I imply then? That food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? What a warning. A warning that we must heed and hear. First thing he says is to consider your life. And I'll, I'll say it like this. He's been building to this one point. He's been building his case to verse 14. And we should hear it and consider our life. He says, therefore, flee from idolatry. That word flee, it's the imperative of the text. This means run from it. This is the second time Paul has used this text. Do we remember the first time he used it? Use it earlier in chapter six, verse 18. He said to flee from something else. He said to flee from sexual immorality. There is demonic activity connected with sexuality. It represents something else going on in the world. So he is making these connections between what we worship, what we give our time to, or, or, or really making the connection between what we do, what we're giving our time to, our resources to, our mental energy to, what we're giving our whole life to, and what we worship. There's something about what we spend our money on or where we spend our time and resources that tells us about what we worship. We all know those families who spend so much of their life engaged in sports. And I can't tell you how many parents I've talked to is like, I just don't know, pastor. I don't know. We raised our kid to love Jesus in the church, but for some reason, they're just not walking with the Lord. We peel back the layers and they raise their children to love sports. They raise their children to try to give them the life they really want. And they worked all this time to help get them the scholarship. They did everything they could because they really thought that if I turn this knob and give this money and give them this opportunity and do this, then they will be the ones that get the scholarship. And they put all their hope and trust in these things. And one day when their kids grow up loving sports and not walking with Jesus, they're going, what happened? You raised them to love the thing that you loved. They love what you love. An idol can be all kinds of things that we begin to give our time to, the things we worship. And Paul writes to say, you cannot remain in this situation. He lands the point immediately following the promise of God, providing a way out. Notice that at the end of chapter, uh, verses uh, 12 and 13, he says, God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will always provide a way of escape. So what is he saying now is he comes in and says, flee from my daughter. So when you see the way of escape, flee it. So that time, that window is short. When you're in the moment, we should be the kind of people who are so walking with Jesus. We know the Lord. When temptation comes, we pause and go, oh, I don't want to do that. I want to flee that. Look for the window of opportunity, the knock on the door, the ring of the doorbell, the text of the phone, whatever it might, might be, however the Lord interrupts you. And then take it, flee it immediately. I'm not going to proceed. I'm going to go this way because ultimately I want to honor Christ. I want to honor the Lord. And when God provides that way out, we must step in obedience. He says, I speak to you as sensible people. Notice what he's doing. We've learned that the Corinthians were all about their own knowledge. They all puffed themselves up. They thought they were good. They thought they had it together. And Paul writes consistently swatting all their arguments. And so now he leans into that. Like, I, I know you're a sensible people. You're a wise people. Judge for yourselves what I am about to say. So he's making the case that idolatry in any form is unacceptable. His admonition should make the, Christ, the Corinthian Christians and us should make each one of us 
really take a long, hard look at what they are doing, considering his words carefully and judging for themselves what the wisdom is, what is a wise and godly thing to do. The truth is wisdom and godliness are the two things that really should mark God's people. We should be the kind of people, if if God is wise and godly, we want to be wise and godly. We, we must be pursuing wisdom and godliness because it will save us from a lot of terrible situations, a lot of tragic situations. I mean, if I just went across the room in here today, I know there'd be tons of stories of tragic things that have happened because we pursued unwise things and ungodly things all across this room. I, I could ask any one of you to stand up and share a story. I could ask Larry to stand up and say, hey, Larry, tell us something unwise that happened. And Larry would be like, I could tell you. I asked John to stand up and say, hey, why don't you tell me something that happened when you pursuing things that were ungodly or, or whoever or, or, or Gonzalo. I, I could do that because there's stories that all of us have when we were pursuing things in unwise or ungodly ways. What happens when you pursue those things? You're like, man, I just need to get out of that season. I need to get out of that life and I need to pursue wisdom and godliness. And so Paul is driving them to understand that there's wisdom and godliness in pursuing single-handed, focused, a focused walk with Christ. So like this charge the Corinthians, we too should consider our own life and take a hard look and to see if we have made a haven for idolatry of any kind. So let's now together consider our life in light of what Paul says. Second thing he says is to consider your fellowship with Christ. He's built the case, he's delivered the point, and now he's, he's going to continue trying to get us to what he's going to say in verses 19 through 22. But the first thing he does, he makes a stop in these two illustrations, and he uses the Lord's Supper. And here's, I want you to hear me on the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is two ordinances of the church, is baptism and the Lord's Supper. At Christ Community, we draw a pretty hard line on the Lord's Supper. Why do we do that? We do it because we want to fence the table because we believe it is very important for all of us to consider where we sit before the Lord. If we're walking in obedience, if we've obeyed him before, or, and if idolatry of any sort has kind of made a home in our hearts before we partake, because it's very important. Let's look what Paul says here. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ, that word participation is the uh, Greek word quantania. It means fellowship. It means we have fellowship with Christ because of his death. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So these two things he brings in here is the Lord's Supper, the cup and the body. And the cup represents the vertical relationship we share with Christ. In Christ... We have been forgiven of our sin. We have been set free from sin. We've been given an inheritance in heaven. Why? Because our hope is in him and him alone. Now there's people from different backgrounds here. Let me just address this on the front end. There are people who are Christians. You've given your life to Christ, not by your own merit, but by faith in him. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There are some who maybe come from a more religious background where you feel like you've got to work your way to heaven. You've got to earn your way to heaven and you've got to confess your sins to a priest. You've got to pray to Mary and to someone else. You've got to do religious things. You've got to attend this or attend that. And you never really feel like you know if you're good. And you're always living in fear that maybe God's going to not like you and let you go. And it feels heavy, and it honestly, it is heavy. And I believe it's unbiblical. And then there's others, you, I mean, I don't know. I'm just here. I'm trying to figure things out. I don't know anything about the Bible or Jesus. You're all in a good spot. And I want you all to know that the Bible teaches salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And anyone that would come to God through Christ can be saved because it's not in our works are we saved, but it's in the blood of Christ. And so 
When you come and you confess, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have no merit on my own to be saved, but I trust in Jesus. The Bible says he saves you immediately and you're given grace and forgiveness and you are his, you belong to him. You can have assurance of your salvation. Like today, when I walk out of here, I know if I, if I get hit by a car and die, I am in heaven. I just know it because my hope is not in myself or my own works, but it's in Christ. And that invitation for anyone who would make Christ the Lord of their life. And the truth is over the last few months, many of you have come to believe that truth. And your invitation today needs to just respond and say, you know what? I believe that. I'm ready to get baptized. I'm ready to live for him. You need to just take that step of, of today. But this, this point that Paul's making is it represents our relationship with Christ. Now, there's a lot of people in, the American, in America who believe that Jesus is Savior, right? He's the Savior of my life. But then their life is largely lived independent of Christ. We, we remind ourselves in the cup of blessing, in the cup of juice, the taking of the Lord's Supper, reminding ourselves of the blood of Christ, it's covenantal. It represents God's covenant with us, like Israel took it in the desert, took the Passover. They reminded themselves of God's covenant with them. When we take the Lord's Supper, which we take it here once a month, it reminds us of this covenant God has with us in Christ, the new covenant in his blood, that he has us and we have him. That means he is not only our savior, but that he is our Lord. That means he gets all of us. He gets all all of me. He gets my home. He gets my house. He gets my money. He gets my mouth. He gets my feet. He gets my hobby. He gets all of me because ultimately it's all his. I am belong to him now and not my own. I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. So if you meet people here like, oh, Jesus is my savior, but their lives throughout the week have no reflection of living for him then you've met someone who's been deceived into thinking they're good. And ultimately, they're not. So he says, man, you should consider your fellowship with Christ, your relationship with Christ. Who do you belong to? You don't belong to yourself. Who do you give your affection to, your attention to? He is both Savior and Lord. It's this idea that the cup represents a vertical relationship. But then you get to the bread, and he says, the bread that we break. Is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Now we get to the horizontal relationship. This horizontal relationship that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is why the local church is so important. This is why I believe you can't be a Christian apart from a local church. You belong to a church. You don't just belong to Christ apart from a church. Jesus died for the church for his people. And you belong to the new covenant people that is in his blood. That means we're brothers and sisters together. This is why you're going to struggle. You're really going to struggle. If you come to church and you sit somewhere in your favorite spot, you never talk to anyone. You never get into a community group. You just sort of sit and hang out and then you leave without ever stepping into Christian community. Because we were meant to be doing life together. We were meant to be looking one another in the eyes and saying, hey, how's your marriage? How's your heart? How are you stewarding God's resources? And for you to answer, man, life is hard. My wife is hard to live with. My husband is dirty. You know what I mean? Like, like it's hard to do this thing because, man, I need your prayers it's, we're meant to have like brotherhood and sisterhood and to say, I'm struggling with sin right now. I'm struggling with contentment right now. I'm struggling with wanting more than I can afford right now. I'm struggling with pride or with this because we're built to be built up together. Because as he says, there is one bread. We who are many are of one body for we all partake of the one bread. So when we take communion together, it represents the fellowship we share with Christ and this Christian unity we share together, this solidarity we have as God's people, not only to live the Christian life here, but to have accountability to finish well. And then he turns his attention to Israel to make this connection between the the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, what Jesus said, 
all the way back to Israel and the Passover Seder. And he's building this argument to where he's about to say, he says, consider the people of Israel are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar. Don't they have fellowship now with pagan idols? He says, this is Deuteronomy 14 and and Deuteronomy 32. When Israel disobeyed and ate the sacrifices offered to other gods, they were judged by God for doing so. And the Corinthian church would have known this. They would have studied that. And now they begin to hear again, and Paul's bringing Israel and he's making this connection to what they did. They thought they were fine until they weren't. And then all of a sudden they were giving themselves over to idols. And then all of a sudden they were judged by the Lord. You ever heard the saying, uh, you are what you eat? You know, you are what you eat kind of thing. That doesn't really mean like if you eat a cheeseburger, like every day you're going to become a cheeseburger. Like if that were the case, I would be an ice cream cone right now. So although looking at the video of me three years ago, man, I feel like I have become what I've eaten. Um, The point is when you eat unhealthy things all the time, it may not necessarily affect your body, although it will affect the outward appearance. It ultimately affects the insides and affects your arteries. It affects maybe your life expectancy. It affects your cholesterol. It affects all the things. And that is the same when it comes to the Christian life and the things that we put up with, the things that we allow the things that we give our time and affections to. What we give ourselves to, our time, our energy, our hobbies, affects not just our eyes or our ears. It affects our hearts and ultimately our whole life. Therefore, we must consider our fellowship with Christ and his people and be reminded that we don't just live life on our own, but we are meant to live with a purpose, to meant to live for our savior who is now our Lord, who has purpose and to fulfill that which he's called us to, all the while setting our eyes on his kingdom to come, living for his glory, being on guard against the idols of the world, because, and this is the third point, we should consider our participation with demons because we belong to him. We must consider our participation with demons. What do I imply then, he says, that food offered to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I don't want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Here's the point that he's been driving to. In participating with food sacrificed to idols, they are participating with demons. Oh, but we can handle it. It's just meat. It's just food. I'm just hanging out on the weekends. It's all good. I'm still going to be one of those Christians. It's just a little bit. Everything's fine. I can handle it. I'm mature. And he says, no, no, no. You don't understand. There's far more at play behind what you think you're doing then you realize in the spiritual realm. Paul says that participation in the one meal makes participation in the other meal incompatible. And just as Israel tested God in the wilderness with their idolatry, they are now testing Christ and provoking him to jealousy. So the demonic is at work in our life. The demonic is at work to lead our hearts astray, to get our eyes off the prize, to lead us over here and to get us not worried about the things God's worried about or not in love with the things that God loves. And our affections, our feelings in this culture rule the day. How you feel is what becomes true to so many right now. And that right there is an idol. It is the idol of our time. And it's not just in these people or that people. It is in all of us. It's the air we breathe, the love of self. So the demonic is at work. Consider these warnings. First Peter, Peter wrote about it. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. John writes about it in 1 John 5. 
We know that we are from God. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the son of God has come, has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. We all say amen to that. And then he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Why do they say that? Because they know how easy it is for us to grow apathetic, for us to grow tired of the wor- of wandering, for us to grow deeper in the Christian life, for us to face what we face in this world, the hardships, the temptations, the trials, it's exhausting. And sometimes we just get tired of it. And we end up becoming like Israel and drifting into lesser idols. What are the potential idols of our time? You just look at a society and I'll tell you the things that the world worships right now, things like abortion is worshiped in our country, protection, alcohol, sexuality. What are the things that are rising? Graphic language everywhere you look, social media, music we listen to, glorification of murder and gaming, the dumbing down of life that God cares so much about. One of the greatest things that we often overlook is in the lottery system, praise on the poor and hopeless play praise on people who are just putting their faith and maybe giving my only $10 to maybe have a shot. Christians just gamble as if it doesn't really affect anything. Throwing away our rich and wealthy money on the backs of the poor with $75 million opportunities, just giving away false hopes on the backs of broken people. We think about success and wealth. I mean, it used to be only in the business world, but now, no, people are doing all kinds of stupid things on social media to be an influencer. They just do. Maybe I'll make it big. Maybe I'll, I'll make a shot here. Maybe, and then you go to OnlyFans and young girls are really believing that if they take their clothes off, they might make a ton of money just preying on finances and wealth and all the things. And many laugh at it or participate in it or watch it. See, he says in verse 22, shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Deuteronomy 32 says, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with admonitions. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently whom your fathers had never dreaded. You were unmindful of the rock that bore you and you forgot the God who gave you birth. We should not forget that God is our creator, that God is our sustainer, that God holds our breath. And listen, I mean, I want you to know, like I'm like, I'm like right here. I'm sitting here. Okay. I'm like beside in, I'm, I'm with you. I'm preaching to myself here. Thanks man. Like, this isn't me telling you. This is me telling me. I'm right here with you. Like, I, I got to be a godly, wise husband, father, leader. So don't be like, oh, he sure is preaching at me. No, it's, the text preached at me. See, one who is bound to the Lord and his fellow believers through participation in the confession that we make when we take the Lord's Supper, that we belong to Christ, that his broken body shed blood, blood is representative of the covenant he made with me and the covenant I've made with him. I belong to him. We cannot under any circumstance participate in the worship of demons. We got to be knowledgeable, wise in God. I mean, those things are evil. I got to be steadfast. Why? Because the Lord is jealous for you. He's jealous for your affections. We should not test him. We should not presume that just because, hey, man, things look like they're going well, I'm getting blessed. Maybe God doesn't care about this or that. No, we should care about this or that because God sees everything. And we want to align what we do up with what God's doing in our life. So this is genuinely an invitation to make a conscience choice where you are. Who is it you're serving? 
What are you serving? Are you serving yourself and your future and your kingdom and your pleasures? Or are you serving our Lord Jesus Christ who went through death for you, who rose to life so you and I can have life? You've been purchased by his blood. You belong to his kingdom. You're called to his mission. Are you in it? For his glory, are you in it for yours? See, to the Christian, an idol may be nothing, but it represents evil and demons have no true power over us. Any power they wield pales in comparison with the power of Christ. Therefore, we must be the kind of people, the kind of people who walk wise and godly lives, not giving the enemy any ground in our life. And whenever we do, we flee it, being on guard against the evils the world presents us, knowing that demons are at work behind all these pleasures. Now, this does not mean that we like hide in a shell and never participate in things. I love sports. My kids play sports. An idol is when you make, when you take a good thing, it becomes a God thing. And that's a bad thing. So there are good things that we can do without making them God things and ultimate and replacing Christ. Money is not a bad thing. There are plenty of wealthy people in the Bible. Wealthy people fund God's mission over and over and over again. So money is not bad. Money is bad when it becomes your security. You find yourself building it up, trying to make sure you've got this much amount and that much money. So when a generosity opportunity comes, you go, man, I'm not going to give that because it's going to affect the bottom dollar. No, my family got to live with open-handed and all kinds of things. That's just one area. It can go all kinds of directions and whatever those things are for your life, good things become God things. That's a bad thing. And when you think you can handle it, Satan has you right where he wants you. So we got to be knowledgeable. Final question. What are you participating in that is incompatible with the Christian life? What are you participating in that is incompatible with the Christian life? I want you to begin to think of it. 1 John 2 gives us a little bit of clarity. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh. So what are those desires of your flesh? The desires of the eyes. What are you coveting? uh, coveting? What are you lusting after? What are you doing you shouldn't be doing? And the pride of life. Those three things, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, and pride of life. Those three things tend to become idols in our life. He says, they are not from the father, but are from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The application is this, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. And here's what I want us to do. And that question, what are you participating in that is incompatible with the Christian life? I want you to just think of the one word. Think of, think of what is it in your mind? What is the one thing maybe that is a feeling you're prone to? Maybe it's a sin that you're, that you're com- habitually doing. Maybe it is a, uh, an idol that you know you can name in your, in your mind. I want everyone to grab a notepad in front of them. You should have a notepad except for the front row. I'm sorry, you're out of luck on this. Unless you can borrow a piece of paper from the, fr- the row behind you. I want you to grab the notepad. No one's going to see this but you. All right, grab the notepad. Everyone's got to participate. All right. And I just want you to rip off a piece of paper there. And I want you to write the one thing on there. What is the one thing that you could think of that you know you're always fighting against? One thing you know you're always susceptible to. What's the one thing? Write it down. Everybody writing, writing something, write, write a word, write whatever it is, write it down. What's the, what's the temptation? What's the idol? What's the thing you're prone to? And once you've got it written, I just want you to bow between you and the Lord. And I want you to just tell him, Lord, you know, this is where I struggle. You know, I'm prone to this. You know, I got to flee this. Right now, just take it to the Lord. ask the Lord to help you in this area to walk faithfully with him 
that it would not lord over you with its power, its false power, but Jesus would. Be reminded that power is in the spirit of God. Okay, now I want you to take it. Everybody rip it off. You crumble it up. I want you to throw it at me. That's right. I said it. Just throw it at me. Throw, come on. Come on. You guys are a little too excited about this down front. Throw it at me. Come on. Yeah. You're going to hit somebody. It's okay. Throw it. Throw that junk. That's right. Yeah. All right. Let it fly. Let it fly. That's right. That's right. Everybody. All right. Man. Yeah. Let's get rid of that junk, right? Doesn't that feel, Brian, quit picking them up. Man, doesn't that feel good? I know it's silly, but man, listen, listen. That's what Satan wants. I can't tell you all to stand up and flee. That's weird, all right? But I can tell you to throw it. Every day, we got to be throwing that junk. Like every morning, we be going, man, this is where I'm prone. This is fighting for my attention, for my affections. This is fighting for my money. This is fighting for my security. This is fighting for my hope. But Jesus, my hope is in you. And so I'm throwing it away. I'm laying it down, giving it to you again. I'm repenting of where I'm prone to. Church, because God loves you. He loves you. His, his love is lavished upon you. Those things aren't worthy of your affection. They aren't worthy of your attention. They're not worthy of your love. There is a home in heaven for you, a mansion for you. Don't give Satan any ground. Mark the circle, not in this house, not in this space. That unforgiveness, man, I'm done with it. The brokenness, it's in the past. Some of you are living with guilt from things you did years ago. Throw it away. It has no power over you. Forgive the guy. Forgive the woman. Walk in freedom. Single, focused, central to our life is the cross of Christ who died in your place for your sin to show you God's love for you. And if you don't know him today, come to him. Come to Christ. Come meet him. Come lay your burdens down. Come talk to someone. Our pastors are going to get up right now, and they're going to come right here, and we're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to invite our pastors right now to come. And if, if you want to be prayed for, if you, want to, if you want to talk with someone about something's going on in your life, why don't you come right now? Now, I've been carrying this too long. Today, I'm giving it over. I'm turning it over right now. Pastor, will you just pray for me? Will you meet with me? If you want to give your life to Jesus, come right now. Say, man, I, I want Christ. Come right now.